Hi, everybody. Today we are going to be talking about Best Served Cold by Joe Abercrombie. And I'm joined, obviously, with some wonderful guests here. It, please make sure that you're subscribed to all their channels. I'll leave all their links down below. Um, let's have you all introduce yourselves before we start getting into the book. Well, nerds, my name is Leslie. I have a little channel called The Nerdy Narrative, where I read lots of things, all the genres you can possibly think about. Well, except for some risky ones. I don't get into that stuff. But as far as science fiction, fantasy, horror, classics, literary fiction, just all of that sort of fun thing I am all about. And I can now add Grimdark to that list. I've never read Grimdark before Joe Amber Crombie, and now I'm addicted. So I have really enjoyed the series, really enjoyed everything I've read by him so far, and I plan to read Ah, oh, perfect. And then and next we'll go to Christian, who actually happens to have a wonderful video on Grimdark, which I highly recommend everybody watch. But go ahead and tell us about your channel, Christian. Yeah, so I'm Christian with Dark Portents, uh, a channel I do mostly by myself, but uh, my wife also occasionally drops in and records some videos on there. Uh, and I... Um, uh, I just review fiction and fantasy. I started out wanting to focus on grimdark, but have since um, maybe zoomed out a little more and just focus on fiction in general. Um, and I have I have read Best Served Cold with the intention of reviewing it on my channel as the first book review on my channel, and it did not actually happen. It ended up being a different book, and I've never talked about it on YouTube before. So, Joanna gets the all that prep. On, on, on her channel. I'm so honored. Wonderful. Yay. And then Gregory. Yep. What is up, everyone? I'm Gregory LaPerch. Uh, I talk about mostly books and other random things, whatever I feel like. It's my channel. I'll do what I want. Um, and uh, yeah. And I, I read mostly fantasy, though. And that's mostly what I talk about. He reads mostly fantasy, but a lot of nonfiction as well. And the way that this came about was kind of spontaneous in a way. Christian and I had talked about doing a video together for a long time. And this was a book that we had both talked about for a while, like maybe we'll do this one. And then along the way, I finally got around to picking it up because my TBR has been so crazy the last several months. And I happened to pick it up at the same time as Leslie was reading it along with our friend Penny, her Instagram. Cat lady, book nook Penny. Book nook Penny. Um, and I'll link her Instagram down below too, because she's wonderful and has some great thoughts on this as well. And then Gregory also wanted to buddy read this with me. So the three of us kind of ended up buddy reading it. And then Christian had read it twice at this point, right? So it seemed like the, mm. didn't you say that you read it twice? No? Yeah, two or three times. Oh, okay. Well, I don't know. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I've read it anymore. Wow. Wow. How many times have you read the first law trilogy? Two or three times. <laughs> oh, okay. And have, you read, yeah. and have you read Beyond Best Served Cold? Have you read all the other Abercrombie books? I, I've read everything published and the only thing I haven't read more than once is um, The Trouble with Peace and uh, Sharp Ends. Okay. So you're ahead of all of, the, of Gregory and Leslie mm -hmm. and I. Gregory, Leslie and I have only read the first law trilogy and this book. So this leads us to the first discussion point, which is whether people should start with reading the First Law Trilogy before reading this book or whether they can start with this book, because it is a standalone. And usually when you hear standalone, that usually means that you can, it stands alone, right? So let's go at it, because <laughs> I know we have some differing views on this topic. I am team read the First Law Trilogy first because I think it will increase your enjoyment of Best Served Cold because you're going to recognize some really fun things. And those fun things you're going to recognize take place after the First Law Trilogy. And so you're going to understand better what's going on with those fun things. Yes. And by the way, we're going to keep this spoiler free for both the First Law Trilogy and best serve cold as much as possible in this conversation for the first part, but we are going to definitely get into spoilers um, further into this discussion. Okay, Gregory. Yeah, I agree with Leslie for all the reasons she said, and just because it, it's the order it was written, so it makes more sense. Um, 
like someone being from the north, as an example, uh, that's like explained more in the first law. Whereas when you meet like a Northman in this book, it's maybe less explained. So you might be a little bit, you might just miss like things that are more spelled out for you in the first law. Hmm. Great. And then Christian, I think you have a different view, right? Well, yes, I do. But uh, my viewpoint starts with everything they've said. <laughs> so I think that it really depends on the type of reader you are. Uh, if you're the type of reader that's going to pick up the blade itself, which is the beginning of the first law trilogy, and you know you're going to finish the trilogy, no matter what, you should start with the first law trilogy, and then you should read this. Uh, especially if you're somebody who has read like the Cosmere and um, has seen, you know, or, or, or Wheel of Time or other like big series, Malazan, and you're like, you have the patience to like, you know, start a book series where you're gonna, you know, not necessarily know where it's all going at first. Uh, yeah, do, do what they said. Okay. That, yeah, that's great. But if you're the type of reader who struggles through the first 100 pages of the eye of the world, or who uh, maybe got to the end of the Fellowship of the Ring and said, that's it? Or, you know, if you want someone, if you're somebody who needs to build trust in the author before you commit to reading three to nine books, Best Served Cold is a better entry point. It grabs you right out the gate uh, the plot is obvious from the prologue. If you read the prologue and you don't want that plot, you don't have to keep reading. It's all forecasted in the prologue. And if you're going to enjoy this book, you will be hooked immediately. Uh, so for example, I have a couple of friends, Casey and Derek, who I told I was going to be talking about today on, on, on YouTube, and they're married to each other. And Derek is an avid fantasy fan and he re he's read all of the big series. And so if I were to recommend Joe Abercrombie to him, I would put the blade itself in his hand. But Casey has failed to start the Wheel of Time, has failed to finish uh, The Name of the Wind. Uh, she couldn't get hooked. She struggles with it. She wants to know what the buy-in is out the gate. She wants the trust in the author. I recommended her Best Served Cold. She picked it up and she loved it. And I don't know if she would have done the same with the blade itself and with the way the blade itself kind of doesn't go much of anywhere before yeah. you get to the next book without spoilers. Uh, I doubt she would have, if she had finished the blade itself, I doubt she would have continued. I mean, I'm a big fantasy reader. And honestly, at the end of the blade itself, I was like, that was great, but I'm not sure if I want to keep going. <gasps> what? And, then, and then, you know, I read book two and it, I'm hooked and I've read it all over and over. When I reread The Blade itself, I loved it all and I see what he's doing. So, I mean, he's my second favorite author to Erickson uh, at this point. So this is one of my favorite authors of all time and I read a lot. And I'm saying that, you know, I didn't know if I was gonna keep going after The Blade itself. So that's just my personal opinion. No, I think it's a great point. I think both points are excellent. Everything that both Leslie and Gregory brought up were good points, and but your point was solid as well. I think it really does depend on the type of reader you are. And you're right, if you're somebody who needs to have a very concrete plot, you're gonna probably struggle when you start the first law trilogy, I'm going to guess. Um, that, not that there isn't a plot, there is, but I feel like it does take a while to get there and it, you see it much more clearly when you finish the whole trilogy. Whereas with Best Served Cold, I think you're absolutely right. I feel like Abercrombie shows his strengths as a writer right away in this book. And I was so impressed with how it started. I was so impressed because having come off of the First Law trilogy and while I loved that trilogy and I'm definitely eager to reread it someday, um, I was expecting, I don't know why, but in my mind, I kept thinking, this is a huge book. It's a new standalone. Obviously, we're departing from the trilogy a bit. It's going to be a slow start. I don't know why I was expecting a slow start, and it was not a slow start. <laughs> <laughs> no. I just want to say I'm really glad I did read the first Law Trilogy first because the Easter eggs and the connections are great. Yeah, and, and maybe I should go ahead and add to that too, because I think that the the thing about this book is that even though it is a standalone and we follow 
a different storyline. We do follow some new characters that aren't in the First Law Trilogy, but we do bring back a lot of secondary characters that are in the First Law Trilogy. I won't say what their names are for the spoiler-free section, so you won't be spoiled if they live or die or whatever, but it was incredible the way that Joe Abercrombie brought back those familiar characters and seamlessly okay. wove them into the plot and seamlessly wove in these new characters. And one of the things that I just am so blown away with with this book and with Abercrombie in general is the way that he can write and in such a cohesive way tie in character motivation, character development, and plot all together at the same time as extending the world that we were introduced to in uh, the First Law Trilogy. I just, the more I looked back on it, I'm like, wow, how do you do that? It's like he did it in such a cohesive way. And that is so impressive. I don't know that every author can do that. It seems like sometimes authors will just attend to the world for a while or just attend to the character for a while, just attend to one thing at a time. But I feel like he did an amazing job just cohesively tying everything together. What did well, you Well, I think he learned that by writing the First Law Trilogy because the first book was characters only, really. And I'm a character-driven reader, so I didn't mind that at all. And then the second book, he started getting into the plot. And then I really felt we saw some world expansion then. By the last argument of Kings, he had it figured out. And this one, he just really had perfected his craft. I just thought it was a total package. I enjoyed everything about it. The characters, I enjoyed the plot. I enjoyed just, I enjoyed the battle scenes. It's just amazing. Yes, absolutely. Does anybody else want to add to that? Well, um, I agree with that. However, on a reread, the blade itself has a plot. All the plot elements are submerged. After mm -hmm. you read the trilogy and you go back to it, you see that all along he's, he's building towards the last argument of Kings from the very first page. Yes. I think I was just so overwhelmed with how much I loved the characters no matter what their motivations were. I loved every single one of them. I didn't care when we switched POVs. I just thoroughly enjoyed every single one of them, literally from page one where I met Logan. Yes. You know, it's funny because I joke that Before They Are Hanged made me into a character-driven reader because mm -hmm. I did feel as though, and I feel kind of, it's, it's strange to say this because I liked the blade itself. I was like you, Christian. I didn't know if I would have continued going in that trilogy had I not heard that it got so much better. Um, but then when I read Before They Are Hanged, I fell in love with the characters so deeply. I loved them in the blade itself, but I really, the, the combination of characters is what sold me in Before They Are Hanged. And then I was just like, I don't even care about the plot. I just, I'm here for these characters. That's all I care about. <laughs> And then by the time I read Last Argument of Kings, I was blown away by the plot and I saw how it was there all along. And uh, for me, I, I, reading the end, reading the last book elevated the whole trilogy for me, elevated mm -hmm. the first book for me. But coming back to Best Served Cold, I just think I'm, I'm just impressed. You do see, like Leslie said, his growth as an author, like how he really builds that into the from the very beginning of this book and it's just incredible to see how he does that yeah i uh <laughs> <laughs> definitely um yeah and that's that's why i like um a lot of like the world building blocks from the first law come into play here like leslie was saying at the beginning um and that and that's great like who has power like what the like bigger power struggle is kind mm -hmm. of and um stuff like that uh, really comes into play later in the first law and is like kind of behind the scenes in Best Serve Cold. Mm -hmm. uh, it definitely it does not take center stage though. Um, but yeah, I'm sure it'll play like a bigger role, like the pow like who has power in the power struggle later on as well. 
Yeah, you know, and that's something that I heard, I've heard people criticize before about, I don't know if you all felt this way. Um, I don't, I didn't necessarily criticize the trilogy for this, but I have heard people before criticize the First Law trilogy for not having enough world building to satisfy most modern day fantasy readers. I didn't struggle with that. I, mm -hmm. I liked world building that was- I, yeah. I almost I said uh, to Leslie that in addition to the characters, the setting is like overbearing in the in the beat plate itself. Mm -hmm. I it's loved like it. So over the top. I don't know how anybody could say that. I mean, do they mean like there weren't dragons and orcs? Like I what do they mean so. by yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean the fact there isn't a map, for example. Yes, oh okay. I, wanted I can't read a map anyway. So <laughs> <laughs> I just look at them and like, oh, that's pretty. <laughs> I'm, I'm horrible with maps. I wish I were better with them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so, I think that's the main criticism. Like you don't have a map and I've just heard people say, I can't picture it. I can't picture this world oh, like, man. where things are. I could I picture it vividly. Yeah, I didn't think so, but I did think that this book really, and by the way, there is a map on this cover. There's your map right there. <laughs> <laughs> he did listen to feedback. Um, but it's really neat to see the way that he expands the world that he created in the First Law Trilogy. Mm -hmm. I, I was just so impressed with that. I was impressed with the way that the settings were expanded in this trilogy and the political atmosphere was also just an extension of that. Even though we get a different set of characters in this particular book, I felt like they were still incredible. Like the way he does character combinations and the way he does oh my gosh. characters is just I... amazing. I got so much enjoyment from this group of characters. So much enjoyment, so much laughter. Yes. And just speechless over things that happened. I mean, Joe Amber Crombie has to be the most unpredictable author I've read. I never expect what he's doing. And even though I know the shenanigans he likes to pull and I'm expecting that to happen, I'm still not ready for what he does. And then something would happen and I'm like, oh, okay, well, there's my little unpredictable bit with this one. Okay, that's, he wasn't done. Then he would turn around and flip it on its end again. I'm like, so good. And I say that in a just absolute utter appreciation, even though I didn't get what I wanted. There was a lot of things that happened that didn't happen the way that I wanted them to but I love what he did anyway. I love the genius of what he wrote, what he did give to me. It wasn't what I wanted, but man, it was just so dang good. Yes, absolutely. I mean, the humor is all there. You get the wonderful prose that Joe Abercrombie has. I feel like Joe Abercrombie's prose, by the way, he just has this way with being efficient. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, it's poetic and I don't know. It's just amazing the way he does that. I don't. Have you heard him talk about how his prose uh, got to be the way it was yet? A little no. bit. I, I heard a um, one interview he did with Murphy Napier on her channel. Yeah, yeah, that's the one, or it's one of the ones. Okay, that's the only right? one. I heard, but. Well, then you then you saw that it uh, it's his mother. Yeah. She she tore his writing apart when he was a kid and wow. challenged him on any like gratuitous prose. Like I he'd write that. something really like flowery and like overindulged and he would, <laughs> she would read it and she would say, but really though, is that really what it was like? Yeah. And, Thank uh, you, Mrs. Amber Crombie. We appreciate you. <laughs> My, I love it. I love, And I love the way he does character voices because each of his characters is so distinct. I, I, it's just incredible the way he does that. But I am so spoiled on the audiobooks. Oh, the Stephen audiobook. Stephen Pacey is amazing. Yeah. And I, I've listened to all of them on audiobook and I will listen to audiobook if that's all I got. But when I can, I read along with it physically for the immersion reading. And even when there's been times when I couldn't listen to the audiobook, I was just reading physically, I could still hear it in Stephen Pacey's voice. I've just gotten so accustomed to him voicing these characters and he does such an amazing job oh, he does man. and and uh just uh the only problem with Stephen Pacey's writing is it's so well done that mm -hmm. when you combine his writing with the or sorry Abercrombie's writing of a sex scene 
with Pacey's narration of the sex scene, you better put your headphones on and like go in a room by yourself because it is weird to be around <laughs> people when oh, uh, Pacey yeah. is narrating that stuff, man. He gets yes. into it. Oh, yeah, man. I was walking my dog. Like the first time I came across one of those scenes in First Law, oh gosh, I was walking my dog in the neighborhood and I literally laughed out loud and there was other people walking around and they were looking at me and they're like, man, that girl's crazy. I'm like, crazy. if you only knew, I want to hear those outtakes. There are, had to have been so outtakes. funny. Yeah. <laughs> our, our daughter, uh, I listen to audiobooks to go to sleep and our daughter came down to sleep in, on the floor in our room <laughs> and one of those scenes came on. <laughs> and I'm sitting there like dying. Oh man. They're not sexy. No, <laughs> funny they're not. Opposite. That's what's so funny. They're not. That, it's, but they're so they're the, funny. The worst. They're <laughs> the worst. I mean, they, they're they're not they're not sexy in like a manufactured like cinematic like, way. Okay. They are sexy in the way that like normal people awkwardly <laughs> having sex is sexy. Like like yeah, it's it's not you know it's realistic. It's how. Yes. I mean, especially when you have like one night stands and people that like haven't done it before and don't have a good rapport with each other. Like that's how it goes, you know? I don't know. <laughs> oh man. Gregory, did you have anything to add? Yeah. Yes, Gregory. I no, think like know. across the board, whether it's like the sex scenes or the world building or whatever, or like the fighting scenes, um, he he definitely doesn't focus on the normal things that I don't know, a lot of fantasy authors focus on, mm -hmm. uh, like it, it in like the fighting scenes, it'll like the focus will be on like, ha like having to take a shit or something, or like <laughs> the sex scenes will like focus on, I, I don't know, like something random. Failing to get the buttons open. Yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> tripping when you're yeah. trying to do something like too ingen ingenious and, or too like, you know, I'm trying to think of the word trying to get too gimmicky you trip over yeah. your, like your you, pants and fall you're down trying to go bed. too quickly or whatever yeah. right it's authentic <laughs> it's it's very yeah. authentic this yeah. so so i'm going to wrap up the spoiler free part here by just saying if you're questioning whether to read abercrombie what i would say is i i think that what christian said holds true if you're somebody who needs to have something to grasp onto as far as plot or whatever definitely you, you can give um, best serve cold a try but either whether whether you decide to start with the original trilogy or Best Served Cold, I mean, I'm personally glad I started with the original trilogy. I really think you'll get a lot out of Best Served Cold by starting with the original trilogy. But uh, either way, what I would say is if you give it Abercrombie I, at least like 100 pages, if even that, you should probably know right away if he's for you. I'd go farther and say, if you read this prologue and you're hooked, you'll yeah. like Abercrombie. You should finish the book. Point. Then go back to the uh, First Law Trilogy. If you read the prologue and you don't like it, you don't need to read Abercrombie. And I, the prologue of The Blade itself just cannot, it's a great prologue. I cannot gamble all of your, will you like this or not on The Blade itself prologue, but I can on The Best Served Cold prologue. Very well said, yeah. And you'll, I think you'll know right away. So give Abercrombie a try. All right, we're going into spoilers now. So spoiler territory here. Okay, so um, I guess we can go right into the prologue then. I was just gonna ask you all a question about it. Could you tell that Monza and her brother Benna were uh, lovers when you first read the prologue? Went straight so over my head. I, I suspected, but I thought it was just like, I, okay, actually, what I thought was, I thought they were together. I didn't realize at first they were brother and sister. But as the story progressed, Monza never admitted to anything about it. She never thought anything about it. So I thought everyone just assumed. I didn't realize <laughs> that it was legit until the very end with when Shivers confronted her. Yeah, I, I I initially thought that they were together. And then when it was like, oh, they're brother and sister. It's like, oh, I guess I misread that. Yeah. Or, and then, yeah, you know, none of my brothers ever 
complimented me like that. And then it became like a gradual, like, are they, are they? Probably <laughs> they are until you're certain. And I think I was certain before the confrontation because of how into shiver she was, the more he was like Beneth. I yeah. read, well, she started dressing him in his clothes too. Yeah. <laughs> right. I, I read the prologue twice because I was so confused. <laughs> Cause I did, I was so confused. I was like, at first I was convinced they're lovers. And then by the end of the prologue, I think it re it's revealed that they're brother and sister or it's either that or the beginning of the next chapter or something. And I thought, what? <laughs> and I went back and I reread it and just, I was like, did I read that right? And then I was like, okay, I'm just going to let myself be confused on this and see if this is an incestual thing because it's not, it wouldn't be the first time we have incest in fantasy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But what I appreciate is while Amber Crombie had this incestuous relationship, he didn't get graphic with it. Like he, he never went into detail. He left it very, a great area, which I kind of enjoy because I was constantly, eh, nah, <laughs> so um, I'm grateful that there weren't details given. So that made it a little easier to accept, I guess. Mm. If it had been graphic, I'd have been like, mm, yeah. sir. Yeah, that, no. that would have been, that would have made his sex scenes even more awkward for sure. <laughs> I, I must have been asleep for the prologue because I like, <laughs> I like didn't catch any of that. And then like in the, and then when I was just like more awake and reading the regular book, I'm like, oh yeah, they're just normal brother and sister. Mm -hmm. And then like shivers, like someone like tells him that mm -hmm. like, it was like an incest thing. And, and he uh, just like, didn't believe it. And shivers w is like the kind of person who um, will like clearly be getting cheated on or whatever, or like something. And like, he won't notice. Or, yeah. He like won't. Know. He's shivers. like too innocent to notice some things. Maybe, maybe at the beginning of this book. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I kind of yes. thought it was a joke between them. I did look back at some of their dialogue, and I thought, in that prologue, and I thought, well, maybe they're just brother sister joking. Like she's looking for compliments and making him dig deeper to give him a better one. Yeah, and I I made that same excuse as well for it, even though like from page one he's like you're so beautiful and it's like so obvious yeah. it throws it in your face which you know is par for the course if you've read the first law trilogy True. the entire ending is thrown in your face from page one of the blade itself the entire ending of the last argument of kings yeah. and you just don't accept it like that like he does it in such a way that the reader refuses to accept that the entire thing is being telegraphed well like, it's his own fault because <laughs> i felt like the whole time i was reading the blade itself and before they're hanged i'm like he is making fun of all of our traditional fantasy tropes. That's what he's doing. And I was there for it. So because he was basically telling us the ending, I didn't believe him because he just kind of hid, he hid the truth within all the lies. He yeah. really does that. He really hits you with like, this is the way it is. This is the way it is. This is the way it is. This is the you way it is. You have to be realistic like, about I'm these things. I'm not going to believe you. But he creates these like grains of false hope. Mm -hmm. Yes. For example, the prologue is titled, Beneath Saves a Life, which makes you imply that there will be some altruistic ending of the prologue for Beneath that he will save somebody's life, which does happen when uh, she falls down the mountainside and doesn't die because she lands on his corpse. Yeah. Uh, and so <laughs> it's <Yeah>. very... <laughs> he didn't actively save one. He, uh, yeah, the chapter... Posthumously. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's so funny though, because like you said, it's like that prologue will hook you. But for me, I was just so stuck on are they lovers or brother and sister? I I, I couldn't handle it. I like, I was just so confused. <laughs> I got so stuck on that. I got to the end of that prologue and I was like, this is Kill Bill in the first law world and I'm here for it. Like, that's what and everybody that's, yeah. yeah. I wonder about his influences too, was going into characters. The char My favorite character, I think in this book, was Marvier the place really yes I loved him I loved that character <laughs> and he reminded me so much of the 
guy from the princess bride the little like bald guy <laughs> Inconceivable. Yeah. It's it's yes yes and even with like the arsenic scene and everything and like he had to have taken inspiration from that character he had to it was so fun anytime <laughs> Morvir was involved i was cackling <gasps> he was an accident waiting to happen Literally. I loved laughing at Morvir. I don't know if I loved Morvir. Well, that's why. I just thought he was hilarious. And like every time he threw an insult, it just, it tickled me so hard. I just loved it. I loved it so much. Well, Morvir is interesting because he's a mirror of Casca. Mm -hmm. They're the same in so many ways, but because Casca is personable, uh, Casca can do something and everybody loves it. Right. And Morvir can do the same thing. You know, and everybody's like, it doesn't land. Yeah, it doesn't, doesn't land. They're the same. They're almost the same character, but one has charisma and the other one just doesn't understand people. And it like totally diverges. I love that. Path. I love that part where he explains that, um, where I, I can't remember what perspective it was. Who was saying that maybe it was from Shiver's perspective, where he was saying that when two people, he could feel when two people don't are not going to get along maybe it was friendly's perspective where he felt like in safety when two people are um, mm -hmm. a yeah fear between two people when they're either too alike or too different that it's going to end in blood and there was so much foreshadowing there that when we had that false death with Casca I was like what but oh man I was so upset when I thought he was dead <laughs> Yeah, because I was like, they're supposed, and I remember it crossed my mind. I'm like, but nothing ever came to fruition with his tension with Marvir. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and because it was so foreshadowed earlier in the book. I didn't really have a favorite character. I had favorite character pairings. Mm. Like I loved anything to do with Friendly and Casca. I loved their interactions with each other. I loved Morvir and Day. I love Shivers and Mons. I love really Shivers with anybody. I don't know why. I just really enjoyed reading anything about him, even though I just kept telling him, like, bro, please open your eyes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> please, sir. And what I really got interested about him, though, is when he heard the voice that sounded like the Bloody Nine. The great leveler. So then I'm thinking, okay, so maybe the great leveler is death of some sort. And then that made me rethink everything about Logan and the Bloody Nine. And I got really excited. I'm like, oh, is this what we're going to have? But then did he get any better battling? No. <laughs> did we yeah. hear much from the voice after that? No. And so I was a little disappointed. I yeah. think I always read uh, the Great Leveler as being death mm -hmm. in the in the in the original trilogy. I'm pretty sure that's supposed to be who 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 what that means. Yeah, yeah. But I did not make that connection until it was made for me in this one. Mm. So now I can't wait to reread the tr trilogy. <laughs> I think somebody kind of mentioned to me or hinted to me that perhaps this great leveler, the great leveler or this aspect of the bloody nine went beyond Logan himself. Mm -hmm. And it did really seem that way. I'm like, wow, maybe this is like an entity on its own. That's yeah. So my thought was if like, you know, we end the last argument with Kings of or last argument of Kings with Logan diving out the tower window, we don't know if he lived or died or whatever. So I thought maybe he died. And so the great leveler, who was the bloody nine, made its way over to Shivers, who was still in the area because he was part of that battle scene as well. I was so excited. And then nothing ever came of it. I'm like, mm. come on, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Um, I loved the little lines, by the way, that the characters had that like, caution first, always. And a drink, a drink, a drink. A drink, a drink, a drink. <laughs> Just some of the little taglines. Oh, I love those. But yeah, that was interesting, though, to see those transformations in Shivers. Shivers was definitely the character that seemed the most changed after the end of the book. Um, that was something that I know, I'm not the only one who have said this. This is an, an original thought, but I know that something that people 
struggle with when it comes to the first law trilogy is not having the typical uh fantasy character arcs, arcs that you have like with mm-hmm. other like it's not the same as like mistborn where you see Vin. Man, see i loved it i loved it too i love not having that part to to think about i love that they were who they were and they didn't change that was refreshing and what i actually thought was going to happen with this one as monza was going down her list of revenge as she got further and was talking to these guys that she was out to kill it became a little relevant as to what they did to her was nothing different than what she herself had done previously to Casca. And the things they said were perfectly logical. And I really thought she was going to have a change of heart and not continue this list. Well, I forgot I was reading Joe Aaron McCrombie and I should have realized she was going to continue that list. But I was hoping for her to stop. But I, I really think, hoped. But I think that Casca kind of put uh, he messed with her man he messed with her so much throughout this book but I think he kind of put the fear in her like who are you if you're not if you don't have somebody to kill you're just some crippled um I can't remember exactly what he said he called her like some kind of sad cripple basically Mm -hmm. so it's almost like that's her identity it's like you're you have no you're a pathetic identity in other words well I think he was also talking to himself as well as her because of where he was and how what value he had of himself because he remembered once he got sober for a while he remembered what he used to have all of the wealth he had many times and turned around and lost it and I think he was talking a little bit to himself as well and I mean Mm. turned all he turned out all right in the end that's a good insight. Yeah, that's a really good insight because he's constantly, he's so consistently inconsistent <laughs> and you kind of mm-hmm. get a, a sense of, or a greater an insight about that at the end, I think, about Casca and his nature and why he is the way he is. I really loved his character though. I, I feel like it's, and that's the cool thing is that even though a lot of these characters like Vitari and Eider and Shivers and uh, in Casca, although they were in the first law trilogy and they, they were secondary characters, as we said, like in the first law trilogy or a third church. Sure, how do you say that? Tert- tertiary. tertiary. I think Shivers was a tertiary character. Oh, okay. Yeah. That well trilogy. said. Yeah. Even that being the case, I still felt like I knew them enough in the first law <laughs> trilogy to see their consistency in this book. Because when I'm, when I encountered Casca in the first law trilogy, the first word that came to my mind was opportunist. This guy's yeah. a total opportunist. <laughs> yep. And everything, yeah, everything about them, except Shivers, I think Shivers is consistent with what he was like in the first law trilogy. But unlike we were just talking about character arcs, he really, really, he really went through a, a time. Yeah. And I think <laughs> that his story, I think that's another reason to read this after the first law. His story got continued in Best Served Cold. And we learned why he really did not decide to kill Logan and he was trying to be a better person and I wanted him to be and I was a little disappointed (laughs) with how he progressed and what he started doing and just killing and not letting it affect him like it did in the beginning which Monza regretted that as well but then I also on the same side of that liked it (laughs) I don't know this man just gets me all confused Yeah, you know, I think one thing that's really interesting to me about Shivers, um, and anybody feel free to interrupt me, I'm sorry if I'm talking too much, but um, one thing that I think is really interesting about what you said, Leslie, is that when I look at Shivers and Monza, I I mean, like you said, it's hard to break these characters apart from each other. They're so paired so well, and they play off each other so well. And one thing that I was thinking about throughout the, this book is that Monza, like you said, you wanted her to change but I felt like rather than her necessarily changing, I felt like a side of herself got revealed to herself throughout mm-hmm. the book, which is the side of her that actually cares. And it's been there all along. It's not like it yeah. was there. Like you saw it when she decided not to kill that family in the tower. Oh yeah, that's, and, that's an excellent point. I forgot that. The whole book, she is portrayed as this butcher and we get to the end and we find out it, 
it wasn't her. It was her. Her brother was a really freaking terrible dude. He was horrible. But he pinned and, it all on her. Yeah. And she was really the compassionate one, which that really, that shocked me. That really shocked me. And I and think. Then th- and then she accepts the role. She's really yeah. the con- compassionate one, but she accepts the role that everybody's pinned her on. Yeah. And just keeps accepting it. And she yeah. does that with shivers. And even though she kind of messes with shivers, I mean, it, she understands why shivers gets so angry at her when she ends up sleeping with rock, rock, not rock. I cannot remember how to say his name. Ah. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. Um, and she, but the thing is, and then of course with his eye, he blames her for that. And she blames herself for that. But uh, the, yeah, that is her fault. That's yeah, not her fault. <laughs> yeah. And at the same time, she even talks about like, there's that one scene where Rognot, I cannot, if I'm saying that right, I'm so sorry. Rogant, Rogant. 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 Yeah. So that part, I think like he, he suggests killing Shepherds. Just get, get him out of the way. He's like yep. a dangerous person at this point. He's going to do you some, you know, he's going to, he's against you. Just get rid of him. He's a problem. And she can't do it because she feels guilty. And so it's almost as though Shivers kind of represents a part of her brother to her. That's how I see it. Like, and that sort of is like the romantic relationship is there, but also the attachment, the unhealthy attachment. And the fact that, you know, like you said, like her brother did her constantly putting the blame on Monza like she keeps accepting it, but it's almost like trying to get rid of a, her brother is like getting rid of Shivers is like doing that. And I should have realized it sooner when they stayed at the house where the farmers were and she refused to put them out and then they turned around and betrayed them. I should, I should have seen it. He was, he was, he was teasing it. Oh yeah. But I just, I didn't connect it. I okay. thought, well, maybe she's changing. Maybe she's growing. Maybe she's going to quit this path of revenge. You know, I think that if you, if we reread this, we'll see other mm-hmm. things that come out because mm-hmm. I notice he says things over and over again, like mercy is, mercy is cowardice. Like that was mm-hmm. something that kept- And cowardice saying. are the same thing. Yes. Yep. And, and, and that cow, or mercy isn't clever or there were lines like that throughout that are planted throughout. And so it's like, he's trying to send you a message or, and then the other message he's constantly hammering is that, mercenaries aren't loyal and that your and your friends are most likely to be your worst enemies mm-hmm. or the most likely to betray you and there's constant foreshadowing throughout the book and I have to admit I got to a certain part where I felt like okay I'm done with this message being hammered into me yes <laughs> part six I got so bored I was like oh come on let's just let's just do something here <laughs> And then part seven totally picked it back up and finished totally strong Totally messed for me. with me. Yeah. Same here. I had the same, I'm glad you said that because I felt the same exact way. I'm sorry, Christian, you were going to say something. I, th- I think, yeah, I think I, I think I had the same experience the first time with uh, part six as well. But uh, a couple of things. Uh, one is, um, speaking of foreshadowing, at one point Shivers says, uh, somebody's going to lose an eye. <laughs> no it's, way yeah it, it's so on the nose i think it's when he's getting his hair cut he's talking to the guy with the scissors you're right um but uh but I, it may have been a different scene i don't i don't know but uh, but he says like those exact words and then um the other thing i just wanted to say was like as much as um as we want shivers or logan or these warrior type characters who all of their lives have been dedicated to war, you know, we, uh, especially like fantasy readers, uh, fiction readers, we want them to get the retirement uh, where they put down their ax and they live in peace and they happily ever after. Uh, it's just not uh, realistic. It's not, it's not realistic. Uh, there's a scene in, um, yeah, can, I, can I talk about another book that's not written by Joe Abercrombie for, for a minute here? Yes. Yeah, so there's a scene I just read recently, and I've reread it multiple times because it's just hit 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 home for me so hard. It's uh, in Richard K. Morgan's um, the uh, A Land Fit for Heroes series, and Richard K. Morgan is a guy who's been writing grimdark and sci-fi before grimdark fantasy really took off, and he came over to fantasy to uh, pollute it with his filth as well. And uh, he has a scene where one of these warriors is meeting with a goddess and she has the power to grant a wish for him. 
And he thinks he wants to wish to live in a city that knows no war uh, that, that he's been told about and have his sword sit in a museum. And the goddess tells him basically that like, what, what would you do with yourself? Are you going to, are you going to mop tables and like in your failed attempt at speaking the local language and, or, or you know, clean tables rather and, and mop the floor up? Are you going to, uh, what do they want to see you? Like, the, the all the wars that have had to be fought so they can have their peaceful city. Do you think those people want to be around you? Like, what good are you if you're not swinging sharp and steel? That's not really what you want. That's just a lie you tell yourself. And that and it's reminiscent of Casca's uh, stuff with um, with Monza, where he's like, if you don't have somebody to kill, what are you? But it applies to Shivers as well. Like, what was he gonna do? Was he really gonna be a fisherman? And it's in a, in a city that doesn't speak no, the language he because speaks. Because he was starving. He was starving. He couldn't find any work. Right. He ran out of mo- ran out of money, and so he was he was starving. And it this wasn't is a, working. This is a theme that will recur, and without spoiling anything, it will recur in the standalones again and again. The dream, the warrior's dream of a peaceful retirement and happily ever after, will come will come up again and again in Abercrombie's standalone novels. And, and he, I like the way he deals with it. Nice. Yay. Yeah, I um, I can definitely see that for sure. And like that, that kind of happened to Logan in the first book as well, or the, you know, first law uh, where he got dragged back into everything. And um, yeah, I- He boy, dragged I, himself back into everything. Yeah, yeah, he could have, he could have run. He could have run, but it came calling back to him. It's kind of like how they say athletes die twice, but um, but this is different because everyone, like, you can't just, like, eventually athletes have to retire because they're not good enough, but, um, you know, there's always more war, and that's kind of like the pessimistic overview of all these books, to, to some extent at least. Um, but yeah, I loved Casca because of that, because he was the one character who was like in the military basically or a mercenary i guess but he was he he had the brain of a politician and everything he did was like um <laughs> he he had some great lines like what do you want me to like go to war right now like you want me to battle ha <laughs> and like <laughs> I won't be on the front lines. It's like, lines. I'm going to be at the, the back. Yeah, yeah, that's the worst place for me to be. <laughs> so I'm going to be where I can, you know, have my drink back here and watch what's going on. But he was super smart. He ended up smelling like a rose, just like he always does. Yep. 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 He's, he's just the best. And yeah. And, and like, he, he was always like a few steps ahead. Cause that's just the way he was thinking. He, he didn't think like a, a soldier or even like a smart military commander he didn't really think like he he really did think like a politician and i didn't even realize it until like two-thirds of the way through really and there was so much that did happen for him by accident and i just absolutely loved every minute i loved every time his name came across a page he was just delightful and i was so upset when it appeared that he had died, like I was, I had tears in my eyes. I put the book down at that point. And so then I was kind of a little aggravated that he didn't. I was like, messing with my emotions. Yeah. They, they had the magic words for Costa. He said something like, go on without me. And whenever a character says that in like any book in like an epic scene, uh, it means that like, they go off screen their death isn't like on screen or yeah. like on the pages and then they somehow don't die <laughs> well i mean i kind of had a niggling thought that he wasn't gonna die because monza looked back and he's laying under the tree with his arms folded with a little smile on his face so i <laughs> sort of was like but then I thought, eh, it's Joe. He definitely killed him. Yep. He's not He's not really one for killing his POV characters off, really. He, yeah. Not too I just much, don't actually. trust him. I don't trust anything. I, I just don't take anything for granted with him anymore. That's probably a good idea. <laughs> yeah. Play it safe. Gregory? I, I didn't like Monza too much. 
in comparison to how much I liked a lot of the other characters in this book and in the first trilogy. I did. I did not care for her at all. I didn't relate to her. I didn't. I loved her plot line. She was the back, like her story was the backbone that this one was built off of. And so I appreciate what she did with it, but I just, I I never liked her. I never really rooted for her. There was a brief moment when she got to the, the fifth name on the list that I thought we were going to see a change that would perhaps make me care for her and that didn't happen. So I never really got interested in her. And then the only other character that I really had high hopes for and got disappointed with was Shanked. Shanked was so intriguing to me. And then when I figured out he was an eater, I was like, oh yeah, I totally forgot about the eaters in the first law world. I was so excited. I'm like, we're going to get to the end. He's going to kill everybody. And then he was like, oh, hey, what's up? Remember me? Oh yeah, we cool. I'm not going to kill her. I'm like, I like that he stepped up to uh, Baez's goons and and the uh, oh the yeah yeah but I, I wanted so much there. more. <laughs> he had the ability to just lay waste and didn't do it. And I did not make the connection that any of you put put together that he might have been the bone the bone collector from the beginning. No, 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 no. never no. saw it coming. And I was so shocked, like <laughs> some of those things at the end and then her becoming pregnant and oh goodness, so many of those things. With whose baby? Yeah. I mean, I, I kind of, I understand how you felt about, about um, Monza. I had moments like that with her. I think that was why that section, that one section of the book, part six kind of dragged for me because it was so much focus on her and I was kind of eager to get to some other characters at that point um but there were parts I really did love with her too like her speech (laughs) was absolutely hilarious to me when she was like having to speak in front of everybody but oh bless her heart I (laughs) was like oh crap (laughs) I rooted for Monza from the beginning and I I never really stopped rooting for her I loved her I guess I'm a sucker for that Kill Bill type story but yeah, I was with her all the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Tell you the probably the two funniest scenes would both would involve Morvir, and I don't know which one is the funniest because I can I can picture things when I read Morvir getting stuck trying to get out of the barn, and then where where when they're he's poisoned the bank and he's escaping and. He accidentally had burned the rope and it went a little faster than he could get across and it broke and he ended up going through the window of Monza and Shivers. While we're doing it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. yeah, I loved that chapter, by the way. The chapter, and, The Safest Place or whatever. Yeah. That chapter was hilarious. And Day was, she was delightful in anything she was in. And I really liked Friendly a lot. Mm, me too. Me too. Friendly, I don't know. I I liked him. And he, he was like a very unique setup, but uh, I, and I liked that. But then, um, I don't know. He didn't stick the landing, I guess. He, But I liked the social isolation aspect of him and how like early on he he was like noticing how everyone was paired up and he's like oh it's just me friendly I have no no yeah, partner or whatever I felt so sorry and it was for sad him. um why are you grunting? and then in like it, it was weird because he liked to be in prison almost uh like at, at the beginning and um that's like it, it was almost like his community and then he ended up latching on to Costa Casca uh, at the end, because that that was like what he was looking for. Um, so I, that that was like because sometimes like people are sycophantically supporting, you know, their leader or like whatever, and it's unbelievable. But friendly supporting Casca was like very believable for that reason. But like I didn't like him throwing the dice and stuff that like got boring and tedious I guess like his inner monologues or like the the humor fell more flat his humor did than like 
more Movir, like his inner monologues were more funny to me. And maybe oh, I'm just man. like a grim person. You're <laughs> just a dog. grim person. Yeah. I got so tickled when they were at, I can't say the guy's name very well. It started with an S, but they, it's the guy who, when Shivers and Monza were in his dungeon, when Shivers lost his eye, that guy. Oh. Before the he got killed. Or whatever. No, the. Yeah. I can't remember the name. I can't remember how to pronounce his name, but it started. I want to say it started with an S, but he and he. The guy with up, the art collection, right? That's yes. What you're talking about. Yes. I don't remember his name either. But right. when Monza gets up the next day, you know she's all beat up and everything, and he's like, "Yes, it seems I'm. I have you two as guests, plus another guest who I'm sure has counted everything in the castle." I got tickled. I I just. <laughs> I connected to friendly yeah uh, emotionally I really just connected to him I liked him I wanted more from him I tell you out of that entire group he would have been the one I would have trusted the most I would have tried to ally with him friendly yep he's a psychopath (laughs) (laughs) he it's it sounded like he had a code Oh yeah, he had a code. <laughs> and I just I think I would have understood how he operated and would have been able to to not get killed by him. To not get killed by him. I mean, he just like Casca did. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what Casca did. And he mm-hmm. like Casca like literally only trusted friendly for mm-hmm. this like entire final quarter of the book and no one else no <laughs> as he then that was like the correct decision and it was vice versa because friendly was like you know what i'm done i did what i said i was gonna do i'm gonna return and monza and shivers were like really bro that's it's like that and he's like yeah it's like that and he's leaving and then as he's walking by the doorway it's like psst, psst. hey man hey man you remember me he's like oh it's my bestie <laughs> and then he stayed for Costco. yeah I think that one of the things that made Casca's character so interesting in each, in the first law compared to this, is who is employing him really impacts the actions he takes and how much of his character gets let loose. Yes, because but I also first, think he plays the long game. He's but in the, ahead of who's sure. employing him. In this one, maybe. But in the first law trilogy, I think Glockta had a handle on it. Mm-hmm. Lockton knew what drove Casca so mm-hmm. that he would never come out of the situation with Casca betraying him. Glockta just knew he had to be the one who paid the most. That's right. And that was part of understanding co- the way yeah. Casca worked. Mm-hmm. But you get employers for Casca who don't understand how he works. And- yeah, because that's what he and Monza did with the Thousand Sword Army. They fake fought and just cleaned cleaned all the coffers. They right. had all the money. So I'm going to tease everybody a little bit about Red Country. You're going to see what happens when Casca has an employer who has no real control over him. And you'll get a different view of the character once again. Every time you come to Casca, you're going to get a different view. Oh, interesting <laughs> interesting i can't <laughs> wait to go into the heroes i've got it on the tbr next month yeah wonderful I, it might be a little while before i can get to it but um i hope you guys enjoy the heroes uh it's a great book it's really well written there's some very fun things that abercrombie does with it and i have the most trouble with it out of every book he's written uh, that's what i've heard uh some people it doesn't bother them but it's it's like all centered around like a large scale battle, like Helm's Deep in Lord of the Rings. And it's, it's three whole, days long. Yeah. 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 And and it's just uh, that much combat, no matter how well the story is told, it, I get fatigue. And like, especially on the audiobook, I'll be listening to it. And like, at a certain point that it's just like, oh, I was just listening for 10 minutes and I didn't catch any of it. So oh, no, <laughs> I struggle yeah. with long battle scenes. In general. Yeah, then then I mean it's worth it. There's some really great stuff, like really creative stuff in it. It's a great book. I'm not saying anything bad about the book. 
just as a person who struggles with long action scenes, there are some moments that are a little rough because it's just too much. Gotcha. Hmm. I'm curious. I'm so curious what more we're going to learn about the first law world, because I feel like the world itself could almost be a character. I don't know if that's a stretch to think that way, but I'm just very curious to see what's going to happen when these other two standalones. Same. Hmm. And then after the standalones, the world gets turned upside down. Also, oh, wow. Well. Okay. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> that's exciting. Yeah, it's fun. In a great way. You'll love it. Well, thank you all so much for joining me on this discussion of Best Serve Cold. Thank you to everybody who watched this. Please make sure that you subscribe to Leslie, Gregory, and to Christian's channels, of course, which will be linked below. And let me know your thoughts. If you, of course, if you made it this far, I imagine you've read the book. So please let me know your thoughts on anything that we've said in this discussion. Thanks. Have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye.